Like the long one, two, three, four, five. The long. Yes, sir. You can hear. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, now I'm going to draw you a picture tonight, and if it seems kind of a little bit kind of jerky for you, and I don't, I, it won't be as smooth as you've heard me before. But I've been have mal uh, macular degeneration here now for about four years, and it's got me now where if I'm sitting with you, sitting, I can't even see the letters up here. And looking at you uh, by the back row, in the back row, I couldn't tell whether you're male or female. My people now sometimes they think I'm snubbing them uh, because I don't uh, speak back to them, but sometimes I can't tell who they are. I couldn't identify you uh, four, four seats back, I couldn't tell who you were. I could tell whether you're male or female, but I wouldn't know your name or who you were. And it gets worse as it goes, so if I'm a little bit jerky in my presentation, that's what's going on. All right, if you've got a Bible there, turn to John chapter 19. 19, get John 19, verse 5. John 19, verse 5. Amen. Now this is Christ, and this is Christ before Pontius Pilate. And he's before Pontius Pilate. Pilate had plenty of time to look him over and quiz him. And Pilate comes out with three verdicts. I find no fault in the man. I find no fault in the man. I find no fault in the man. Now here he has the man up before him, and he's just been whipped, and he's got blood all over him. And when he does, he makes a statement here. Or right, if you've got a, a Bible there at 19.5, uh, look, uh, look, uh, Brother Pastor, if you've got your uh, book there, read us verse 1 through four, verse 5 real loud. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that he may know that I find no fault in him. They came, they, then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. All right. Father, bless this reading and bless this preaching about your grace for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. On there's what he's saying, behold the man. And he's visibly impressed. Uh, he's tried every way in the world to get rid of Jesus Christ and can't do it. Jesus Christ coming like a bad penny coming back. And he can't get rid of him, so now he has to face it. And he's hoping this last time when they whipped him with an inch of his life, the crowd would be satisfied with the blood and let him go. They didn't. They said, kill him, kill him. When he brings him out there, he says, behold the man. And when he says, behold the man, he says it like he's, in, he's deeply impressed, Pilate is. His wife just told him not to fool with Christ. That scared the star, tar, star out of him. And now he's had other trouble, and, you know, and he's had a, she's had bad dreams about him. And the crowd's yelling, kill him, and if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's. He's kind of under stress. <laughs> And so he says, when he brings him out there, he's bleeding head to foot, been whipped an inch of his life, and he says, Behold the man, the man, yeah. not a man, the man. Amen. Uh, when your Bible, you're about the truth, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Yes, sir. Not a truth, not a way, right. and not a life. Right. The, the, the. Right. He says, the man. Now, did you ever think how strong that thing is? There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Amen. Christ Jesus. That ain't Mary, ladies. <laughs> There's one mediator between God and men, the man, the man, the man. Why, I'm, I'm a pastor. I believe in baptizing people. I think baptism is a good thing. But you're not a thing. You're a man. I believe in going to church. I think it's a good thing, a fine thing. You got sacraments and stuff that's good. All right, they're good things, but honey, you're not a thing, you're a man. Amen. And if you ever a man ever gets saved, you're going to get saved by a man. Amen. You see what about religion? That's the most damnable thing you get your hand on is religion. Amen. That's a system that around somebody where if you do this and do this and do this and this and don't do this and don't do that, you might make it. That isn't salvation. Amen. Salvation is a man. There's one mediator, one between God and man, the man. Amen. The man, you got that? Amen. Your daddy was a man, wasn't he? Amen. He came from Adam. Adam's the, Adam was the, was the man. 
You take you ladies, you can bear men and women as children. You can bear male and female, but not without the seed of the man. Right. It comes right. from the man. Amen. So when you talk about this thing, you're talking about something real. Now when you talk about Jesus Christ, talk about him as a man, then you realize what you've done. You done must up everything. <laughs> if he's just a man, then he must be a sinner. But he ain't. Amen. <laughs> And what we fundamentalists do, and nearly all of us do, and I'm, I don't, I'm not against it, we emphasize the deity of Christ. Christ was God manifest in the flesh. That's a fundamental. Now that's fine. But you know something the fundamentalists often forget? They forget that he was also a man. He didn't say just son of God, son of God. His favorite expression about himself was the son of man, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. What's happened is real simple, but no scientist would take it, which means nothing to me. I mean, uh, the, the bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. <laughs> or if you take this thing right when he became a man, then he, became, he came down and, like you, he had to do it to save you because he's not trying to save you when you're a man. Well, a man suffers, doesn't he? Doesn't he cry? Doesn't he, doesn't he, doesn't he get hungry? Doesn't he have friends and enemies? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, he has to go through that to know how to save you. Right. Right. Um, uh, Muhammad saved a man. He couldn't save a squirrel. What are you talking about? <laughs> you have God becoming like you to save you. Right. So salvation is always personal. It's personal. Uh, no religion can save anybody. You say, Amen. why? Because it may be a good thing, but you ain't a thing. <laughs> You're a person. So the question is, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Or are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's a personal type of thing. And folks are always trying to get out of it. And our Catholic friends, and some of them are saved, that's true. But I, and I was a Catholic before I was saved. I was some other things, a Buddhist and a, and a, and a, uh, or a, or a, uh, a high church of England, an Episcopalian too. And that might have been a good thing, but a thing can't save you, a man has to save you. Amen. you have to, Jesus Christ was a man. What does that mean? It means to walk around and have ten toes on. And when you open your eyes and see him up there in glory, he's going to be standing there, and he's got a man's feet. You're going to look at a man's face and a man's eyes, and a man is going to look at you. Yes, sir. We, we don't emphasize enough his humanity. Now, the liberals do. The liberals make him just human. They ignore his deity, you see. But you've got to remember something. He ain't just the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. Yeah. Look at here. He's sleeping in the back end of the boat in the typhoon. Right. You think God has to sleep? No, that's right. Well, then he must not be God. Mm. So that's how Muhammad gets rid of him. That's right. He said, if he's a God, why would he get tired and go to sleep? Mm. So he's trying to figure the thing out. Yeah. Well, he's both. He's the Son of Man and the Son of God. Amen. And you've got to go through what a man goes through. Uh, how, why does God have to, who could, have, who could kill God and nail him up? Are you kidding? <laughs> the one that made the universe and all those galaxies out there, and you can, you can nail him if, you, if, if he's like that? No, you couldn't. He'd have to be a man right. for you to nail him. Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't say, my father, my father. And yet he's part of the Trinity. The Trinity didn't break up. But something broke up. My God, my God, that's the talk of an unsaved man going to hell. He's the son of man. And he suffers and dies as a man and takes hell like a man. How do you know he took hell? I thirst. You think God gets thirsty? He made all the water there is. Christ says, the woman will give me a drink. He never got it. <laughs> He's hanging on the cross. I thirst. <laughs> That's right, I hang on the cross, I thirst, he didn't get it again. That's the man. There's no separation in the, in the Trinity. That one saying, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken, is the place where the man Christ Jesus has taken what you ought to take in hell. And if you ain't allowed, careful, that's what's going to happen to you. Well, now we're talking about something human here. What, 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 how he was like human? Well, he's like human in the... Well, he got his feelings hurt. How would you like to be... So, so, uh, suppose a brother Peacock asked you people, can you tell me what you think I'm worth after preaching for you a while? And you said, well, I think about uh, $25,000. Uh, 
Somebody said, well, I think about $500. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I think about a half a million. Yeah. He, the shepherd said to the sheep, what do you think I'm worth? I'm quoting Zechariah. And the sheep said, 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a dog. You think he wasn't injured by that and hurt by that as a human being? We be born not like you born. We're born, God's our father, Abraham's our father. We were born like you. Our, your mother was a whore. She got you out of birth, out of season, pre-marriage. Pre we're not like you are. We're, we're, the, we're, we're, we're the real thing. See that stuff? Uh, you think that didn't hurt his feelings? You think he wasn't insulted? And he wasn't cussed? His own best friend comes forward and delivers him over to the devil? Uh, according to him, and the, the one that delivered him over to the devil was the devil himself, like walking through a man, Judas Iscariot. Right. And Judas comes up to him, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, he comes forward and kisses him, and Christ says, what do, you, what, what do you come for, friend? Friend? He calls him friend. My goodness gracious, what a thing. Why, well, he's being betrayed. You're dealing with a human being who could get his feelings hurt and looked over Jerusalem and wept. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And went to Lazarus' tomb and wept. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, Behold how he loved him. That's a man with a man's feelings crying and eating and sleeping like a man. He says to the woman, I'm thirsty. God ain't thirsty. I'm not there here worry about being thirsty. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Right. And he's asking you for a drink? That ain't the God part of Christ. That's the man part. Amen. Well, thank God he was a man. I, I couldn't get along with him if he wasn't a man. You ever stop thinking about me if he didn't come down as a man? How, you, how would you have fellowship with God if he hadn't showed up as a man? Somebody who can make an, a, a furnace out there that's 8,000 degrees, the sun, and a bunch of galaxies they can't even find yet, and keep the whole thing running, and you're going to get along with him? <laughs> what do you think I've got in common with somebody who could make an earthquake from here to San Francisco and make it 2,000 feet deep and five miles wide and kill 20 million people and never blink? What do you think I'd have in common with him? <laughs> Not a cotton-picking thing in this world. Now I can understand Christ. He came down and had two legs and ten toes. And I guess he brushed his teeth after he ate. He ate a piece of fish, fish and honeycomb. Like a, I can get along with him. But God the Father, God is a spirit. No man has seen God at any time. I've got nothing in common him, with him. And the Lord knew it, so he came down here to get where you are to get to you. Greater love of no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. But God commendeth his love toward us, and yet we were Christ sinners. Well, when we were sinners, Christ was given for us. Well, Christ is the man. That's the Son of Man. On the of the Son of Man, and he says, Behold the man. He says, Behold the man, and I'm going to take him a little bit further into it. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to just talk about the man. I'm going to say, first of all, and the first of all should be first of all, uh, behold his life. Behold his life. No life like this that lived on this earth. No man has ever lived like Christ. Nothing, not, nothing like, like him around in 60 centuries. You ever stop to think about this? There's only one man who ever lived on this earth. There's no record of any other man that anybody sang about 2,000 years after they were dead trying to get the Mohammedans together with the Hindus and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you cracked or something? Yeah. They'll lock you up in a nut house, buddy. Amen, you got a, you got a hymn book right down there. You've been singing out of how many, how many hymns are in that book? Over 500. How many? Five, over 500. Over 500 songs yes, about a dead man? Yes, sir. Are you crazy? No, sir. <laughs> What's the other dead man who has that much song about him? Uh, Why, well, you don't know he ain't there. Amen. <laughs> You ever heard say, we have heard the joyful sound, Muhammad saves, Muhammad saves. He couldn't, he couldn't save a pancake, man. Now, now that, some of you kind of get a little, <laughs> relax, 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 you know. It doesn't hurt to be a little bit crazy in this world. If you were a little bit crazy, you couldn't stand this one. <laughs> uh, cocked out all the way. Now you take that business, see that business right there? After 60, after 2,000 years, you're still singing a song about a dead man. Why? 
little old boys and girls, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you're singing about a dead man? That's wild, man. That's wild. Here I got 500 degrees and I'm singing about him? Name another man like that. You can't do it. You haven't got a PhD with an IQ of 200 that could do it, and you never will. Amen. Behold, the man, boy. Boy, he says the man, I mean, that's the man. That's what's going on. The man, Christ Jesus. So I behold his life. What about his life? Well, about his life, I'll tell you about his life. His life is like the life of no other man that ever lived. What man do you know could come along and feed 5,000 people out of a basket that had a couple of fishes in it? Did you ever stop thinking about that thing? You, know, you hear about the thing, but you don't think about sometimes what you're thinking of, what you're talking about. He fed 5,000 people out with a little boy, had a little basket there and a couple of fish in it with some rolls of bread. And he feeds them out of that thing and he gives the disciples those to pass out. Did you ever stop thinking about how you'd feel if he gave you one of those baskets to pass out with 5,000 people sitting down? What did he give them? The kid only had a couple of fish, fish and and he gave them to the 12 guys. Well, that split up, you'd have a half of one fish about that big to start your past now with, and you had to feed over 100 people there. There are 12 guys feeding them. You know what you had to do? You had to go through there with that fish and thing, and as you took it out like this way, it's getting replenished in your hand where you gave a cotton-picking thing up. Uh -huh. Did you ever think about that? The guy's walking through the earth with hundreds of people and it keeps coming from, from where? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you where, out of thin air. <laughs> now let's see the United Nations do something about that. <laughs> Why, man, if you could find a guy like that, you'd solve the world's hunger problem overnight. Yes, there isn't anybody like that. Amen. When you get Jesus Christ, you know what you're doing? You're doing with a perfect man and a sinless man. And if you're ever going to be saved, it's going to be saved by a man, by a man. There's one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man, the man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's the business. Christ said, no man cometh to the Father except by me. If you're born again and saved, you have to deal with a man. Now, I don't know how many of you folks are saved, but down south you always have more than you do up in Yankee land. And you have more saved in Yankee land than you do in Africa and Asia and Europe and those kind of places. I don't know how it is. But I know some one thing, if you haven't had a confrontation with him, you're not saved. Amen. Him that cometh to me, I don't know why is cast out. He didn't say church or religion. Me, me. Amen. Salvation is personal, fella. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, stand in the need of prayer. Amen. Can you put your finger at a time in your life when you came to Christ as a sinner and knew you were going to hell? and turn to him for salvation Amen. and call upon him for salvation? Has that happened? If it hasn't happened, you're not converted. Amen. I don't care how good you are, you've got to deal with a man. Amen. All right, behold, I say, first of all, his life. Now, what kind of a life is that? Well, what a gentle life. Suffer the little children coming to me. What a gentle life. He never got an army. He never put up a rebellion. He never tried to get back at anybody. Uh, James and John one time they say, Lord, they said we saw so many there that didn't follow us. Can we send, call down lightning and strike them down? <laughs> and he says, nope, he's not as for us, uh, not as against us, as for us. He says, don't that, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, I came to save them. That, how, how's that gentleness sort of stuff? Why, he said one time, a fellow told him about getting out of, uh, getting out of crucifixion. And he said, I, in a moment, I could call a couple of legions of angels. He could have called, one angel could kill 185,000 men. That's in second can. The kings kill them in one night. Uh, a legion of angels, a thousand angels, each one killing 185,000 people. Boy, you're talking about a wipeout, man. Well, he said, if I wanted to, I could. And he could, and he didn't. And he didn't. Did you ever sit up some day or some night and think about actually what God Almighty has had to put up with from America since 1776 without wiping you all out? Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber ways of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God bless his, shed his grace on thee and bless thy good for, with brotherhood from sea, sea to shining sea. 
by an alabaster city's gleam, undimmed by human tears. <laughs> what are you talking about? You crazy or something? Or alaba Have you been in any alabaster sisters of America where there's no tears? I've been in a few of them. I've been in Boston. I've been in New York. I've been in San Francisco. I've been in Diego. I've been in Vegas. I've been in Montgomery. I've been in, in Memphis. I've been in Chicago. I've been in Detroit. I've been in Topeka, Kansas. I've been in Kansas City. And every other cotton picking place. Yeah. Something like about, four, about, about 46 of them out there. I never got, got into a city where it was ungleaned by human tears. You think they do that at Key West? <laughs> Go there and check them out, brother. If you can come back without getting hit by, by a sex pervert. <laughs> Amen, amen. Amen. <laughs> Kids, I'm no spring. I'm, I'm not a spring chicken. <laughs> my, my, my air mileage was 40,000 a year for 50 years. That's over 17 times around the equator. And I've talked to saved people in, in a half a dozen countries, and I never met anybody who was sorry they trusted Christ. Amen. It was 100 It was 100 percent. I'd consider his life, what was it? It was gentle. It was sweet. No revenge. We get something goes on, somebody says, boy, oh boy, if I ever catch that so-and-so, I'll do. You know, that's how we are, you know. Or if somebody said that about me, I'd knock the block off. You never heard him talk that way. They somebody slapped him in the face and spit on him. All I had to say was, Lord, get them, and they'd all drop dead. <laughs> but he didn't do it. And I sat there and took it and took it. That doesn't, doesn't remind me of myself. When I look at Christ's life, it doesn't remind me of myself at all. Whatever, whatever else I might have been or he might have been, I, 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 folks, folks let them say, say, let them see Christ in you. I don't know how anybody could see Christ in me. I mean, it's at the best. I tell people, if when you see me do something that's right and good and godly, I'm not doing it. That's the Lord in me doing it. Now, if I make a mess of things and mess things up bad and do something wrong, that's me. See, that's me. You know why I enjoy pre preaching these prisoners here any, or any place else? I preach the Rikers prison, of, uh, the, the, mafia, the uh, uh, ma mafia prison up there in New York and the big slammer in, uh, Atlanta, in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And you take them to those places when I come in, the first thing I tell those fellows is, you know the difference between you and me is? The difference is you got caught and I didn't. <laughs> they have a better sense of humor than you do, so they, they laugh at that, see, and whether they believe it or not, but it's true. Man, if I have right now had got caught with, I think, of eight or nine good federal offenses, <laughs> <laughs> Miss me when I was coming up when I was 12 and 13. I was second story man when I was 12 years old. If I couldn't get a ladder, I'd climb a tree and get in through the window. I'm 15 years old. I'm driving back from a wet state to a dry state and bootlegging back in a stolen car with no license. Uh, I've, I've been things, but if I got what come to me, I'd, I'd be, I'd have some time to play, say, I'll oh, kid you not. I'm no different than the guys I'm talking to, except I didn't get caught, and they did. And someday, everybody's going to get caught. You're a Christian, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's Paul talking about the judgment seat of Christ. You think God told you to quit fearing him, but when you got saved, he said, quote, work out your salvation with what? What? Fear and trembling. Uh, a Schofield note says for a respect. Ah, uh ah. -uh. No, no. Trembling. <laughs> no. Writing on the wall, that kind of business. Consider his life. What's his life? His life is all good. It's, not, it's no bad. He's the only sinless man that ever lived. Nobody else even professes to be that way. You don't believe, you, maybe you're not, not called yourself, you say, I, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm going to be a Hindu and worship this and that. You can't find a Hindu leader who professed to be sinless. Muhammad didn't profess to be sinless. He professed to confess sins all the time. Then he said, I don't know where God's going to, what Allah's going to do with me when I die. Why? You, and 
You know, oh, I shall do. Rasuli Lala Shahala Mohammed. There is one God, the God. There is no God but the God, and Muhammad is his prophet. And then you say, Where are you going when you die, buddy? I don't know what Allah will do with me. You don't, and you're his prophet. <laughs> well, you got a pretty dumb God didn't tell you where you're going to go. Amen. 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 Kid, are you saved, young lady? How old are you? How old are you, this little girl? Are you saved? A nine year old kid <laughs> knows where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one God of uh, uh, Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. He put him out selling popcorn. <laughs> I mean, you've got kids who are 9 and 10 and 11 years old know where they're going. Amen. You see how dumb Christians are? <laughs> Christians, they're actually Christians who think those are peaceful people. You're, you're crazy. You ought to be locked up. You're dangerous, boy. Yes, sir. I've read that book through 17 times. My... my uh, Koran is marked up almost as my Bible's marked up. Those people cheat the world. The whole world is going to become Muslims one day. And until then, your job is to get rid of everybody who isn't a Muslim. Right. And if your wife gets married to a Christian and becomes a Christian, you're to kill her. That's the Sharia. That's the Muslim law. All right. What, what's a man like Jesus Christ? The, the man like Jesus Christ doesn't exist. There aren't any. You consider his life, it's all good and no bad. There's no bad in it. There's no bad in it. He was all good and all the time. And if he was all good all the time, he was sinless. And you don't know a man who was sinless. And nobody professes to be sinless. I haven't met anybody yet who professed to be sinless. I mean, sometimes the charismatics said they, you know, they were, I told one of them time about sin. And he said, well, I, he said, the Bible says, be holy because I'm holy. And and sin not. And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to believe that, but I've, I've sinned. Man, if I, had to give a, if I had to give you a count right now for everything I've thought in the last two days, I'd go to hell like a bullet. <laughs> Come on, smile, smile. You feel a little stiff tonight. What's the matter, boy? You done quit being honest with yourself? Come on, man. Have a nice day. God loves you. <laughs> All right, what is it? It's that the life of Christ, the life of Christ is sinless. No man can say that and tell the truth. But he could t t t do it and tell you the truth. I mean, think of a life, think of a fellow who never had to clear his throat and say, what I meant to say was this. Think of a man who never had to apologize to anybody. Think of a man who never had to confess a sin before he went to bed at night. You can't name one. <laughs> How long? 60 centuries. 4,000 B.C., 2,000 A.D. 60 centuries, you can't find a man. Except the man. Amen. Behold the man. All right, there's that. Now, now, behold the man. Now, I say something else. I say what? I say, behold his friends. This man is a friend of publicans and sinners. How about that? Jesus, what a friend of sinners. What a friend we have in Jesus. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And oh, he's a friend of just ordinary plain people. You know, it's, it always bothers me to think how people think, and they do think this way. A lot of people think this way. A lot of men think that Jesus Christ is just a rich kind of a deity that preachers talk about to make a living about. He's a big shot, you know, hanging around with the big shots. Not Jesus Christ. He walked around Galilee in his bare feet there and with a with the fisherman. First four guys he picks up to be friends with are fishermen. Right commercial fishermen. Yeah. You ever know any commercial fishermen? Yeah. I know them. <laughs> you want about somebody common, you know. Old fishermen never die, they just smell that way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's some of the roughest, poorest crews you ever find in your life, boy. That bunch. And they're his buddies, four of them. He didn't come down and contact the big shots and the rich folks and the uh, people in the paper to get, brag about him. Just common, ordinary people. Two in the road to Emmaus. You don't even know the name of one of them. That's what's going on. Consider his friends. There was a friend that sticketh sick closer than a brother. One time a little girl named Edith went to a daily vacation Bible school, never been to one before. 
And she came back and told her mother what a wonderful thing it was. And the mother said, well, what did they teach you? They said, well, they taught about how I'm going to get to eat meal with Jesus someday. And she said, well, what? And and the girl's name was Edith. And her mother said, well, Edith, they didn't mention you by name. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mentioned my name. So they're going to eat with Jesus one day. And she said, well, now, what what did your teacher say? He said, Jesus held a feast one day. And and this this man received sinners and Edith with them. <laughs> well, that's kind of you know it's around there somewhere, but it's around there somewhere. Now that's friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Did you ever stop to compare him to the modern modern uh, people way where they compare to each other? You realize that fellow com- uh, he he finally finished the most uh, uh, the most well. The most wonderful, amazing, awesome thing in the history of man, a dead man coming up after he'd been down three days, and he come back up. Where's the news media? Why did he go back to Pilate and say, look at here, see, I told you. He never even bothered to go by and see him. Well, if that happened, if a fellow came out of a graveyard after four years here today, you talk about the system you've got in the in the web and the internet and all that stuff, it'd just be blah, 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 all over the place. Not him. You walk along the road to Mayor said, What you two fellows worrying about? Oh, don't you know about what happened in Jude in Don Judea today? And he said, No, tell me. <laughs> he, he just <laughs> he just come out of the grave, man. <laughs> See that thing like right there on a, uh, here's a storm at sea, and here's a, a what they what they call them, pseudonyms or something or something like that. The big typhoon blowing away and Master, we perish, and up there gets and says, shh, be still, blow up. Down goes the water. Where's the, where's the news report? Here today, you know what happened today? In Lale- 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 there are those people in boats out there beside them, and those fellows were out of the storm, and all of a sudden went whoop, went right back down. That's a news item, isn't it? Yes, sir. Wasn't even broadcast to anybody. He don't even bother to fool them. You know, what, you know what the Jews were looking for? They were looking for a savior who'd come on a white horse with a sword around his waist, and he's going to do that. But not now, when he comes. But they're looking for him. And how does he show up? He uh, shows up in a pot, lot of swaddling clothes and then a poncho. I said, well, that thing is the hole in the top you put your neck through the shot dice got for. He comes, he comes with a, not a sword, around, a towel around his waist to wash dirty fishermen's feet. You can't find a man like that. You never have and you never will. When I compare my life with Jesus Christ, there's just no comparison. I couldn't handle that kind of stuff at all. Behold the man. Behold the man. He's a friend of of sinners. Behold the man, a friend of sinners. Are you a sinner? Well, I've got good news for you. You've got a friend that's going to stick with you closer than a brother. All that stuff about that stuff. All right, what is this thing here? This thing here is a man that uh, is, lives a life that can't be imitated anywhere, and his uh, friends are just common, ordinary, everyday people. I don't know why people don't trust him. I think they think that, we, that you have to be somebody rich and effective and high up on the status in life, you know, a congressman or a dentist or a doctor or something like that to get along with Christ. Uh-uh, not that much. Not, not, not that, that money. He's standing around watching people put in money, and he packs a widow on the back for putting in two mites called pennies, which is a, their, their thing would be about 25 cents a day. She bought two 25-cent pieces she put in, and he said, those rich fellows put in just what they wanted to put in, but that lady gave all she had. Right. Okay, that's pat, patting a poor widow on the back. Those are the kind of people he's around. Right. Are you just a common, ordinary person? Amen. Oh, he's made for your measure, your measure, not the big shots. When the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them and believe. Foolishness, foolishness. He said, if any man wants to be wise, wise, let him become a fool that he might be wise. And he said, we're fools for Christ's sake. See that? It ain't the smart boys. You realize the only time he ever, ever, uh, you know, uh, rejoiced? Now, I'm sure he did some other times that aren't recorded. But if one take come rejoice, you know what it says? In the hour of Jesus Christ rejoiced, you know what he's rejoicing about? You'd never guess. You see, people probably never guess. You wouldn't read your Bible that much. 
was only one time and it said he rejoiced in the spirit and it wasn't over anybody getting saved. And it wasn't over anybody getting healed. You say, what was it, Rockman? I shouldn't tell you. Make you look. <laughs> Ought to make you go home and look. You say, why? What's the most monumental things the fellow ever said? He said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, the highly educated, the MAs, the degrees. Some men die by degrees. And he says about that, he says, that, he says, Rejoice in the Spirit, I thank thee, Father, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and reveal the babies, for so it seemed good in thy sight. That was his idea of something funny. He rejoiced in the spirit and said, thank God you made a fool out of those educated folks. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Don't worry about going to college. Some men die by degrees. <laughs> you know, my color made, made me told me, God bless her heart. She, I used to listen to her and, and learn some things. You know, she said one, one time, she said, Doctor, I don't mean to tell you you got a, T, a Ph.D., you got a Ph.D. I said, that's right. She said, law me to hear you preach one wouldn't think you had no education at all. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take a million bucks for that. Yeah. You know why? And she's telling me common, plain folks can understand you. You're down Amen. there where they are. Amen. I wouldn't take $10 million for that. Amen. She told me one time, honey, child, if you ain't got no education, you just got to use your brains. <laughs> That's the trouble with most folks. They think they got brains because they've been to co college. I don't guarantee you no brains. One of the biggest sapheads you ever met in your life have college degrees. All that kind of stuff. That's how that thing is. What, 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 behold the man. That is some man you're dealing with there. I mean, uh, that, that education, that, that, is, that, is, that is something. That is really something. You know, one time I got a telephone call of a Saturday night at about uh, 11 o'clock at night. Preachers always like that right before Sunday, before they're going to, you know, get, get the message ready. And I got a telephone call from a drunk, and it was a drunk I used to drink drinks with back in the old days. Sidecar, boxcar, Manhattan martini, Singapore sling, slow gin fizz, Cuba Libra, Rum Collins, Tom Collins, the whole mess. And he phoned me up drunk and said, Pete, will you come over my house and talk to me and my wife? <laughs> And I said, what's you wrong, you and your wife? Well, we, we're fighting, Brother P, and, and we ain't getting along. We're having trouble. And I told her about you, and I, I said, you, uh, I wish you'd talk to Pete Ruckman. And she said, well, go on for him. So I phoned you. Would you come here and talk to us? I said, okay, I'll be over there. So I got over there and came to the house, got there about 12 o'clock, knocked at the door. He and his wife were in the living room, and he came to the door, and she was sitting there on a sofa near the door. And he came to the door, and he opened the door, and crying, and said, Come in, Pete. And I stepped in, and he said, Show me Jesus, Pete. Show me Jesus. Now, how'd you like to have that put on you, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> Saturday night? <laughs> and I just happened to have a copy of Tell It Like It Is. Amen. Have you ever seen that thing? Yes, sir. And I had a picture in there of Jesus. I said, There he is. <laughs> Pull the thing out like that. And boy, he dropped in front of me on my face, on his face there, kneeling and praying and crying. I knelt with him and led him to Christ. And he got saved. And when I looked up, and he looked up, his wife was sitting over there, just white as face. As she walked out, have a heart attack, a Episcopalian, uh, blue blood, you know. Good lady, but you know, you could fill your fountain pen every time she sweat. <laughs> and she's, and she, she's, she's sitting there like this, staring. And he said, go talk to my wife, Pete, go talk to my wife. So I went on and sat on next to her and said, sister, are you saved? She said, I'm an Episcopalian. And I said, I was an Episcopalian before I was saved. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes, but I was christened. And I said, I was christened. You had a father, a godfather, and a godmother. And she said, yes, but I was confirmed. I said, I was too before I was saved. And the drunk, still nearly mother, door began to laugh. And he said, I told you, I told you, Peter Ruckman, tell you the damn truth. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, see, that wouldn't mean nothing to you, but a guy like me has got more sense than you got. I wouldn't pay you $10 million for that. I, I, I never heard the truth connected with damnation before, but it was an interest in the exposition. <laughs> but you, you take, you know what that fellow was saying? 
he was saying, I want somebody to talk to you, and I can't trust these other preachers because they'll try to get around your blind side by soaping. I told you, Ruckman would tell you just it like it was. Amen. There's an old drunken bum that believed in me. I wouldn't take, a, I wouldn't take a, 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 an honor from Harvard alongside that. I'll tell you another one. I mean, I've, I've been around the ropes a while, man. I'm preaching a rescue mission one night, and a couple of them getting saved, bums and stuff, and about that time the thing is over, and, and a bum comes down the aisle, and people getting out of the, 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 uh, the uh, what, what do you call it, where they, where they sleep. Uh, and uh, he, he, he a little bit drunk. He came up to me and he said, how are you doing, preacher? I said, oh, pretty good. How are you doing? He said, well, I got saved from being here last year. <laughs> He had, he had three sheets in the wind then, two blown away. <laughs> and he was saying, I was, I was here last year and got saved in your meeting. I said, well, you ain't good, doing so good, are you? He said, no, I'm not. But I'll tell you one thing, preacher. I missed a freight train out of here in the night to hear you preach. <laughs> and it's you, the only man I ever could understand. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything, any amount in the world for that. That's an old drunk that took a Mr. Right out just to hear me preach because I was plain. I always want to be just like that. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if the big, rich, smart boys don't like me, I couldn't care less, man. You couldn't keep me awake. Oh, <laughs> right, now what is that? That's his friends. This man is, makes a friend. He's a friend of sinners. When I get into prison and get talking to these fellows, and I will say I really start the same line every time when I talk to them. No, I was talking. The Bible says Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Paul says that, that's how he's chief of sinners. And he says, this is, I, I want to have you know something. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Not the good folks. He came to save the bad folks. He came to save the bad folks. Are there any sinners in this building? Yes, i got good news for you. Christ died for sinners. He didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. Hey, you want to get saved? You'll have to join the thieves. You say, why? Where was Christ crucified? Calvary between two thieves. You say, well, he wasn't a thief. He wasn't a thief, but he was, quote, numbered with the thieves. So I don't know how you stand with the Lord. If some of you folks are pretty high and mighty, maybe. I'll tell you one thing, you'll never get saved if you'll take your place with crooks. Amen. 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 If you go to Calvary and all the sins are forgiven at Calvary, you got in with two thieves and somebody numbered with thieves. Amen. You'll say, Ruckman, I can't take my place among thieves. I never did steal anything. He never stole anything either. Amen. And he took his place with them. Now, how is that? That's something. What is that thing? Is something? That thing is something? And that when you say, Behold about him, you so say, Behold the man, you say, Behold his life. And then you say, Behold his friends. No friends like that upon this earth. All poor folk, common folk, ordinary folk, or carpenters, fishermen, things like that. It makes me so angry when I think about all the poor guys and bums I've preached to about these things, and they sit back there and they don't want to come because they feel like. This all to do with this preacher's making high money, you know, and talking, dressing like this, and acting like this. Listen, if you're just a poor, common, ordinary day laborer and don't make more than $2 an hour, the greatest friend you'll have on this earth, if you ever had one, is God's Son. Amen. Though he were rich, yet he became poor for your sake, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Amen. There it is. Yes, sir. All right, consider his friends. Consider now his enemies. What were they? They were, rich. they were rich. They were rich and they were proud. And they were educated. And they were religious. That's what they, you gotta, you, that's, where, that's where the trouble is. It's with the big shots that I think they know everything and they try to run everything for you and try to tell you that if you do this and do this, you'll be saved. If you don't do this, don't this, you won't be saved. If you wind up in hell, it can't be for anything you do. When the Holy Spirit has come, Christ said, he'll reprove the world of sin, righteousness, judgment, and sin because what? Come on, because what? 
What do you read, Pogo or something? <laughs> you don't know that verse, why the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin and you're saved? The Holy Spirit will come and convict them of sin because adultery? Uh-uh. David committed adultery. Murder? You couldn't go to hell for murder. Moses murdered a fellow and pit him in the sand, went on home to glory. Amen. Hello, are you awake yet tonight? <laughs> What do you read? I wonder sometimes if you read any at all. If you ever go to hell, it won't be for lying, swearing, stealing, embezzling, kidnapping, uh, streaking, being a pervert, being a, a double-breasted fink, or a, a butcher, a dyke. You're not, you're not going to go to hell for that. Oh, yeah, the bumps and the grind, baby. I mean, if you ever go to hell, it won't be for any of that. A fellow made a, a, fellow made a, he made a, 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 a track one time, and it said, what you need to do to go to hell. And then you open the track up, there's nothing but two blank white sheets of paper. <laughs> you know what you've got to go to do to go to hell? Nothing. You're doing fine. <laughs> What's the sin? Because they believe not on me. Boys and girls, as long as you're sick, you ain't dead. You don't die because you're sick. You die because you don't get well. And if you go to hell, it's not because of sins you've committed. It's because you didn't take the cure. And that's the cure. Behold the man who bore his, our sins in his own body that on the cross, that we being dead to sin might live in the righteousness by whose stripes they whipped him. By his stripes you're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turn everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him Amen. the iniquity of us all. Amen. You want to go to heaven, trust him. Amen. What happens then? When you die, you die sinless. You can't put me in hell after I die because I'll be sinless. Say, so where are your sins? They're on him. Amen. Now that's what that thing's all about. He made the payment. You know why a fellow goes to hell? Because of something he doesn't do. That's, right. That's a strange thing. But it's true. Behold the man. No man like that. Why, there's no man on this earth upon whom your salvation depends except Jesus Christ. Not a man alive. I don't have to worry about some bishop, some pope. I mean, some, uh, some spaghetti-eating fellow with a little half a grapefruit on top of his head going around meeting uh, Hail Mary full of grapes blessed be the fruit of the loom and all that junk I don't, I, I, don't, I don't have to mess with that kind of thing listen that bird has been over here three and four times and with all the nation out is watching him on TV and hearing him on radio you never heard him tell you one time he was saved or how to get saved Amen. the vicar of Christ ah oh, blow it out your nose <laughs> vicar of Christ you vicar of Christ, and you don't know you're saved, and you don't you have eight, nine, ten million people listening to you. You can't tell them how to get saved. You're the vicar of Christ. Uh huh. <laughs> run, sit, get, get a shoe polish stand, work on it, Pope. <laughs> All that stuff. All right. But consider consider that. Consider that his friends. Get him, preacher. Now, Amen. <laughs> now, now consider. That's a little better. That's a little better. <laughs> Now consider this, consider his enemies. What are they? They're cruel, but they're educated and they're religious. He said about those Pharisees, he said that when you get to hell, your damnation will be double. So you'll get the, low, the, high, the heaviest damnation for you, and that was to the Pharisees. You imagine being a pope being down in hell when you arrive down there, you have a hundred million people there ready to curse you. Because you didn't, they, you didn't tell them how to get saved. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you, you better have, you better be Adolf Hitler than be a be, than be a pope. Amen. Amen. Hitler might only got 22 million of them killed, but he just didn't send 50 million of them into a lake of fire forever. Right. Right. All that stuff. Right. Now, what's that thing? That's they're educated. Now, you know why I talk like a hillbilly sometime or a briar hopper, you know, or a cracker? I do it on purpose. I mean, I, I, speak, I, I come in a negative enough for a problem. I don't want to have you confuse me with Christ's killers. Right. Amen. I sometimes talk to you, you might think I'm your enemy. I'm not your enemy. 
and I'm not Christ's enemy. You might, think, you might think I'm your enemy. That might be. I don't know. But I want to act, conduct myself in such a way you'll never mistake me for a rich, highly intellectual, educated liberal. Amen. Never. Amen. And I'll make sure you don't. And I'll t- <laughs> talk until you admit he couldn't be. <laughs> I got to save more of my people are Episcopalians. Most of them, most of them no military went, people, and they were West Pointers and, and, and Episcopalians, Church of England. My father was a lieutenant when he went into World War I and he came out a captain. And he went into World War II as a captain and came out a colonel. And my brother went through it as a sergeant and I went through it as a shave teller, lieutenant, infantry, all of us. And my granddad was a, was a major general from the Philippines direction. My great grandfather was a, a, a colonel. All my people are military, all of them. And all of them lost, just as lost as a goose in a horse race. <laughs> But when I got saved, you know, my mom and daddy told me, they said, if you will, well, first of all, they did deny it that I was saved, and they thought I was crazy and told me to go to a doctor. And then after they saw that I stuck with it about four or five years, they decided I was serious. So they said, if you'll go to the, church, to the, the Swanee College in Tennessee, it's an Episcopal ch- uh, college for training rectors. Uh, uh, an Episcopalian pastor is called a rector. Very good in his description, <laughs> rector. <laughs> and they said, we'll give you money if you'll go there. And I, can you imagine me coming out as an Episcopalian rector with a collar on backwards <laughs> and saying, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I can't even get away with it with you, man. <laughs> Some of you dumb nuts, you'll hear people preach like that. I, I couldn't even get away with it. Amen. I'd like to make a more buck out of you and make a fool out of you, brother. Well, come in. What, what, what would you think tonight if after he introduced me, I came up here and say, well, this wonderful congregation, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Oh, glory to God. I feel so... What are you laughing at? <laughs> That's what they do. Amen. Well, why don't you go, ha, <laughs> ha, like that. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about people yelling back to your pastor. He's too rough and too crude to be mistaken for anything else. <laughs> and just like Carl Lackey, the same blood, Billy Sunday, the same blood, Luther, the, he, Luther called the Pope your, your, your hellishness. He'd write him a letter and say, Most hellish father, greetings. You, <laughs> you know the trouble you folks, you're like dogs. You, you, I just don't like the tone of Ruckman's voice. What am I saying? Well, half time you don't hear it, your word so much of what you're hearing. Now, I breed German shepherds, about 40 of them, and they're all alike. If my German shepherd's out there and they're going to come in, and I say, I say, good dog, good dog, good dog. <laughs> He'll lie down and put his, yeah. you know, his and you know, <laughs> he doesn't hear what I'm saying. He listens to my voice. They come, suppose the dog came and I said, well, good morning. Uh, uh, Fritz, you go to his I'm going to take you to uh, 38 in the backyard and blow your brains out. <laughs> he just wag his tail, you know. You know. <laughs> well, that's how these dumb, stupid Americans are. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the roughnecks. They'll start shooting straight with you. But you got to look out of those smooth, slick ones. Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. <laughs> Let all the earth Rejoice before him. Amen, amen. Choir, amen, 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 amen. Choir, amen, amen. I'm sitting there, an eight year old boy, I raps. <laughs> I'm raised in that Episcopal church. I'll never forget the shock I got when I got, stood by the door one day for a while with my dad, and the people were coming out, and I heard him talking with the pastor, or the rector. And I never heard him talk out of the pulpit till then. And up in the up in the pulpit it was, and I see blessed Simon Peter. <laughs> blessed Simon Peter has walked the waters, and I learned the lesson that there is so much uh, good in the worst of us, and so much uh, best, uh, uh, so much good in the worst of us, and so and so much worse in bad things in the best of us that it. Illy behooves us to one another to correct one another 
and even think of God sending to anybody to such a terrible place as hell. <laughs> and, and I stood back there by the door, and out they came, and, the, and, the, and here was the rector. Good morning, Miss So-and-so. Good morning, So-and-so. Good to see you, Jim. Yeah, we all the stuff we see about the golf. And I, th I didn't think he'd be like that. I thought he'd stand at the door and say, Good morning, Mrs. Smith. Good morning, Jones. It's glad to have you. That's the way he talked in the pulpit. <laughs> Did you know so you come into church, that doesn't convert you into a Christian? That's right. You can walk in a garage, you won't turn in an automobile. But some people think when they come in there, they change suddenly. Now listen, you hear where I'm talking right now? Yes, sir. I talk that way. In the house, out of the house, when I'm hunting, when I'm fishing, when I'm playing hockey, I can't play anymore. They won't let me play anymore. <laughs> I, I had to quit at 84. <laughs> and, and all that stuff like that, I, I talk the same way there. I'm talking to you right now. Amen. And it, the one thing, for see, you may not like what I say, but I'll tell you, bless my soul, you'll understand what I said when you go out that door. Amen. And if it costs me something, that's tough apples. Oh, now what do you have? You have, 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 have enemies. What are his enemies? They're cruel. They're religious. They're educated. They're the upper crust of hum humanity. They're on the top. And what are they? They're murderers. Their consciences don't even work. They say, don't, don't let us go into Pilate's judgment hall. We'll sin against God. And while they're doing that, they're murdering his son. Amen. See how, how things go? That's how they go. They go like that. Or oh, they're, they're consider his friends and consider his enemies. Enemies of the high, the hoi polloi, the big boy, the ones upstairs. And then Christ said, "It pleased God by the foolish of preaching to save them that believe." Behold the man. Behold the man. What about him? Well, behold his, behold his death. What is his death? It's voluntary. No man taketh it from me. I take my life and I lay it down and I pick it up again. It was voluntary. It was substitutionary. The Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. It, was, it wasn't a martyr's death. It was a substitution. His death for your death. And it was a terrible death. How do you take men? Men are experts when it comes to killing. And when it comes to think of horrible, terrible things, you can trust man to think them up. I mean, the Comanche Indians would take a fellow and take him and bury him down in the sand up to his neck. Then they'd put honey on him. Just leave him there. The army ants ate him up. There'd be a guy there screaming for three days with the ants going in one eye and coming out the other before he finally died. That's man. When it comes to hurting and torturing, he's a genius. Uh, wise to do evil and not wise to do good. When the Germans wanted to get a fellow and really get information out of him, couldn't get him, they put his eyes behind his back and tie him up, then take a hat pin, like women used to wear about eight inches long and stick it at his tail end and then poke his intestines with it. You get results. Now that's man, that's that brilliant man. Man is the measure of all things. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. You know what they did Nom, Nom a couple of times, get Nom, they take one of our boys, get his hands tied up and then put a, like a bird cage on his head and put two rats in it and then close the bird cage and leave it there until they finish chewing him to death. Mine might take two or three days to show off his face. That's man. Smart boy. Brilliant. A man is the measure of all things. Getting better all the time. Oh, you crazy nut. Or oh, what in the world? If you get all the better at a time, why do you die? Amen. <laughs> Next time you're even the evolutionists think you came from a monkey or something, say, explain death to me. I mean, you're always developing. Well, how come they bury you with a shovel if you're always developing? <laughs> The Bible said, dust thou art, and the dust thou come, and so forth and so on. Man, man is a brilliant, that kind, uh, that kind of stuff. The, the, the wrong stuff, the wicked stuff. I'll never forget one time when World War I or, just, or World War II just started out. I was in the hospital a couple of days for a strep throat, and uh, a couple of guys came back from overseas for <coughs> medical treatment or something. But I got talking to them about their experiences in Guadalcanal, those kind of places. And one of them was telling about a Japanese he killed by grinding his hands down on a, grin, on, a, on a grindstone. And he said, I got a hold of that SOB, and I got him down there, and I, he, he kicked off on the fourth one. Got, he laughed, so, you know, he, if I got the fourth one, he couldn't take it all off, and he just died of a heart attack. 
And they laughed about it. And I said, well, you mean to tell me you've got a kick out of hearing a guy scream like that? He said, well, sure, wouldn't you? I said, I don't know. He said, what if you lay in a slit trench all night and heard one of your buddies out there in the dark screaming and screaming three and four and five hours and you couldn't get out, you'd get, you'd get fagged if you went out there, you'd get blown up. You had to listen to it all night long. And the next day when the attack took, went by the place where they were, you find your buddy hanging up there naked and he's flayed like a deer, cut around here and just pull off like a sweater, just cut off like that. He's hanging up there with parts of his body cut off, stuck in his mouth. And it was a buddy you were raised with. How would you feel that like? Wouldn't you like to hear the guy yell that did that? I said, yeah, I guess you, guess you would. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to live like a dog and die like a dog, I guess you're going to act like a dog. Yes, I said, man, man, man. Yes, sir. Amen. I quit reading the Bible through it 150 times, and I can't read it anymore at all. I can't even read it with glasses. Glasses and uh, uh a magnifying glass. I can't read it anymore. But I got it read 150 times through before I got there in the thing. And reading that thing and reading that thing after I, well, maybe a year after I was unable to read it. Of course, I've got it on tape and play it on tape all the time. But after about that time, I, I, I thought occurred to me that never occurred to me till then, and you'd think it occurred to me long before then, but it didn't until then. And the thought suddenly occurred to me, do you know why that Bible has that black cover like that? It's because it's a negative book. It's about death. And then I open that book and three chapters in and they start dying. And I check the dying, it goes to Revelation 20. Three chapters before it starts, they're killing each other. And three chapters at an end, they're killing each other. And I said, you know something? Yeah, I've been reading this thing and being in the military, I should have guessed it because they're fighting all the way through it. I'm Cain Ox, Abel's brains out, Abraham has to chase, chase the, the uh, Persians and run them out of there in that battle in the, down near the Dead Sea. And then, I, did you ever read Judges? Yes, it's all fighting. Amen. Amen. Did you ever read 1 Kings, 2 yes, Kings, 1 Samuel? There, this battle after battle after battle. And I, I've got the message. Now, you won't agree with this, but it's okay with me. I never worry about that. <laughs> you know what I thought? I thought to myself, I know now what, why God gave that book. And it's not salvation. Now, thank God it's in there. I'm glad that God got me in on it. See, yeah. I'm sure I'm glad. That ain't what that book's about. That book is about a king and a kingdom. Yeah. The whole thing. And so it has war from start to finish. Amen. And that book is trying to show man, you cannot live peaceably with each other without me. And without me, you can do nothing. Amen. And no matter what you do without me, it's going to be a flop. So I repeated it once, twice, three times, four times, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Every time a big country came up and dropped God, out they went. I could name them in order and take them out all night with it. But it's continual killing. You're tell God telling you, you're no good, man. You're a failure. You, you can't make it without me. Amen. And the unsaved UNs and stuff is, yes, we'll all get together, you know, and all the women will be men, and all the men will be women. We'll all get together, and all the Catholics will be Muslims, all the Muslims will be Jews, and we'll kill everybody that doesn't agree with us. You can't do it. Look at, look at here. here here's, you want a conceited statement. Without me, you can do nothing. What if I made that statement to you? It would give you a horse laugh, wouldn't it? What's it? Without Pete Ruckman, you can do nothing. Oh, your father's mustache. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't do that. But Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. Well, if he said that, you know what that means? That means without him, you can do nothing. <laughs> you want to raise your family right? You can't do without him. You want to eat? You can't eat unless he lets you eat. You want to stand up? He'll take your legs out for money in a minute. I've got two friends. You had one here in the church the last time I was here, I think, with no arms and no legs, born that way. See that stuff? Without him, you can't, you can't breathe. Boy, you can't walk. Amen. You can't raise a family. You can't do anything without him. Amen. And that's why that book is written to show you've got to have him. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Thank God it's so, brother. Thank God it's so. All right, that's what that thing there is. All right, that thing there is... Uh, a, a terrible, horrible death, dying for sinners. 
see from his head and his, and his feet, streams of blood flow down. It airs such uh, uh, so, so for me and God and God and Ray and God does something. I forgot the words to it. So rich a crown. What's that on his head? It's the crown of thorns. Amen. What it's there for? Well, God knows what he's doing. And when Christ dies on the cross, what do you get here? You get crown of thorns on his head. What do you get that for? You've been thinking stuff you shouldn't be thinking. Yes, Filthy mind. Yes, the sin is paid for. They're there. In go the spikes, now comes the blood. In go the spikes, now goes the blood, and down it comes. That's, that, I've seen that uh, type of thorn along the, sh uh, the Shawnee River coming down into Pensacola and into Florida. And those spikes on the thing are about that long. What happens? There is in his head. What's it coming down from his head for? It's coming down his head because I thought stuff I shouldn't have thought. Amen. God don't miss it. He got nails through his hands. What are they for? I know what they're for. If you don't, you're, you must be what nice, white, and clean. But I know how my hands are bent on some things they shouldn't have touched. Amen. Dirty things. Amen. So I'm paid for here. Don't you see how God knows exactly what you need? Amen. When he dies, a spear comes along, and a Roman soldier takes a spear and jabs that thing through the fifth rib right by the heart. Why? Because you love things you shouldn't have loved. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. 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 You're not going to bushwhack me if I was talking to the U.N. I'd say it on I'd say it louder. Amen. I mean, you love things you shouldn't have loved. Amen. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and you missed it, and you missed it, and you found 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 it, and, you found it, and, you, and I found it. Amen. 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 Amen? Come on, a little bit harder. Amen there, brother. Amen. Yeah, a little weak on yourself there, that stuff. Look here, he's walking along here, and what's, what, what's he got? He got nails in his feet. What has he got nails in his feet for? I know. I know why they're there. They're there for Pete Ruckman went places he had no business being. Amen. And he's 17 years old, and somebody tells Pete Ruckman go to hell. So he went down to the French Quarter in New Orleans because that's the nearest place he could find to it. <laughs> when that hurricane hit, hit uh, the French Quarter down there, did about $100 million worth of improvement. <laughs> <laughs> And you go, I know, I know what's wrong with those in the feet, Ruckman. You're getting off there at uh, uh, Hell's Half Acre in Honolulu and going down there at 2 o'clock in the morning looking for trouble and usually find it. I know what's wrong with them feet. They're going down to fifth Pier Number 5 in the Philippines, getting out in the Chinese thing at night at 2 o'clock in the morning with the drunks and looking for trouble. And you have no business being there. So then the feet. Amen. Amen. And when God takes his son and whips and beats his son, it's because of sin. With his stripes you're healed. A whip comes down on him and goes across every part of his body. And with his stripes you're healed. All we like a sheep have turned away, we turn everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid iniquity of, of us all. I do not know the depths of Jesus' love that brought him down to earth. From heaven above, nor why he bore the cross up Calvary and shed his blessed, precious blood so willingly. But this one thing I know, that when the crimson flow dropped to the earth below, it fell on me. My eyes were open wide. I saw him crucified. And knew for me he died on Calvary. I do not know what I can do or say. My debt of gratitude to him to pay. But I at least may cry, O oh Lord divine. Had I a thousand lives, t'would all be thine. For this one thing I know, that when the crimson flow dropped to the earth below, it fell on me. My eyes were open wide, I saw him crucified, 
and knew for me he died on Calvary. I saw him, him crucified, for he, you're saved by a man. Now, before we close tonight, I'd ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. No, I'm not going going right now. I'm only going to go later in a few minutes. I got a couple more points here. (laughs) But when you finally get, I'm going to do, and I have you bow, you know what I want you to do? I want you to search through your heart and ask yourself, have I ever come to God in faith knowing I'm a lost sinner on my way to hell and can't save myself and trusted Jesus Christ to save me and asked him to save me? And if that hasn't happened in your life, you are not converted. You have to have a head-on collision with somebody. Not just good things. A lot of good things, but they ain't going to get you saved. All right, now look down here. The portrait. Behold the man. Behold his portrait. I'm trying to draw you his portrait the way it was. My beloved is white, but ruddy. Ruddy is red-brown. And hair is black as a raven. They have pictures of Christ where he has red-brown hair like a Scotchman. He has a black like a raven. He's a root out of dry ground. Just nothing. Nothing romantic about him or handsome about him. Just an ordinary, plain Jewish carpenter. Head black as a raven. He says, eyes like dove's eyes. You ever look at them? They're kind of gray. Dove's eyes. My, love, my beloved is so forth and so on talking about him. And they said that when he was on the way to the cross, he fell down to the ground and Veronica, a Roman Catholic saint, got a handkerchief and spread it on the ground and got a photograph of his face on the handkerchief. <laughs> so that's one of the things the Catholics have is a handkerchief with Christ's face on it where he fell on the ground in a pig's eye. <laughs> Amen. They've got two different skulls of John the Baptist in Europe. Right. Two of them. At one time, they asked him about, somebody asked him about that and said, what is that? Well, this other woman, when he, when, when he was younger, was a baby. <laughs> 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 Something got screwed up there somewhere. The Catholics say that every church in Europe has a, a part from the cross and a piece of lumber from the cross. If you put them together, you could build a Roger Ranch-style house out of them, man. <laughs> that's all this stuff. All right, that's what's going on. What's a portrait of him? Well, you do a, do, a, do, a, do a portrait of him. Why, you have to make him a man's man. Pilate says, behold the man. He's a carpenter for 18 years. He didn't have hands like uh, Mother Teresa or something, you know, or all that kind of business. A, a portrait is, is a man. He's a man's man. They put out a, a mess called uh, Jesus Christ Superstar about 30 years ago with all the hippies were going. And they had at the end of that thing, Judas was still alive and Christ was dead. And they were asked what it was. They said it's a modern picture of the gospel. The gospel is not that Judas was alive and Christ was dead. The gospel is Christ died for your sin, then rose from the dead, and Judas went out and hung himself. But it was kind of a teenage type of thing, and Christ was a little teenager, you know, probably on dope. And in Gethsemane, he's saying, I don't understand myself sometimes. And sometimes the, the apostle, oh, yeah, man. I mean, that kid, if you stuck him in the knife, he'd have to do five push-ups before he could bleed. <laughs> and this guy's down there like this. I mean, have you ever noticed when these fellows have their picture taken, they always have their clothes on? You don't see any of this atlas stuff with these hippies, you know. They have nothing to show, man. They talk with their clothes, not muscle there. looks like a flea-bitten piece of spaghetti, man. <laughs> Um, some of those fellows make a good lifeguard in a, in a sauna. With those, uh... <laughs> Jesus wasn't some sissy like that. Amen. Listen, listen, listen. Anytime you think that's being a sissy, bud, tell you do. You go home and get in your house and take off your clothes and lie down on the tongue and groove flat on your face down there on the floor and lie down there and stretch out your hand and say, Oh, God, from now on it's going to be you instead of me. From now on, what you want, I want, and what you're going to do, I'm going to do. And Lord, I'm not going to get up until here and you accept me. I'm going to do what you want me to do when you want me to do it. And thy will be done, not mine. Amen. I bet some of you never did that. You talk about Christ being like a sissy girl, you're a cuckoo. Yeah. If you think it's being like a sissy, they say to Lord, Lord, here's a sheet of paper. Sign, P.R.S. Ruckman, 
Now fill it out. Amen. Try something about the sweat come off you, boy. Of you big shots around here. They don't have any courage, no, no spiritual courage. Well, that's the portrait. Now, in a way, I'm kind of cheating you because really, if you saw him right now, he wouldn't look this way at all. You say, why not? In these ancient of days. When, old Paul, when John sees him, he has white hair. Like a sound, eyes like a flame of fire and feet like brazen. What's white hair a sign of? Trouble. Been through trouble. You know, one time my mother was telling a little girl about how to, um, she ought to behave herself. You give mama gray hair every time you do something wrong. And the little girl said, well, boy, your mama must be a terror. <laughs> Her hair's white, you know. You must have caused her trouble. That's the same, that's the same Savior that was Luther when he was trying to cut off his head. That's the same one was in the jail with the martyrs before they were burned to death. He's been in every kind of trouble there is. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And what you're going through, he's been through. That's what he is. You want a portrait of him now? You'd be, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't match him at all right now. All right, finally, you see that thing, that influence? What is that influence? That influence is nobody ever in the world, any, in the world, anywhere in the world, any man of any culture, any woman of any culture, ever had the influence on men that people have. I mean, something when you have a, 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 a collision, a head-on collision with Jesus Christ, you're never the same again. Now, maybe you don't whip everything ever right away. Maybe you don't get victory over sin right away and that kind of thing. Maybe you have trouble all your life. Be not deceived. God does not mock whatever man sows, thus shall he also receive. You'll, you'll get payback. Boys and girls, when I was got to be 90, I was still reaping some from some stuff I did before I was 20. So you're sinned and forgiven, but the effect of them may last a good while. Amen. If you want to go home to God in glory, go home first class, don't go home second class, third class. God's going to get you home. That's good. He's going to get you home after kick you and beat you all the way. I remember one time I saw a big old fat sister going down the road. She was like Aunt Jemima. She must have weighed 300 pounds. <laughs> And she was going down the street, and she had a little white boy in my arm. She was told to take him someplace, and she was taking him. But as he is hitting the ground about every four or five feet, and <laughs> screaming and how yelling bloody murder, she wasn't paying a bitch of difference. She was singing to him. I heard her singing this hymn. She went by me, da 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 boink, 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 that kid going on like that. And I said to myself, you know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of the Holy Spirit taking a disobedient Christian home to heaven. Boink, boink. Amen. But you're going. Listen, I got bad news for you. If you're saved, you're going to go to heaven whether you want to go to heaven or not. <laughs> uh, maybe you're trying to go bad back with the old bunch. It ain't going to work, buddy. Right. You're just dragging in by your hair when you could have walked in. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. Now you take that in. What, a, what, a, what influence he had. Some of you have never run into him, and you know you haven't because it hasn't been any change. But boy, what a change, what the old song, what a change the weather is going to be. And I don't remember, that's an old swing song, I'll let that go. And it, but you take coming up there like that, the way he's coming up there like that, and getting ready to go to home to heaven. He comes up and dies and buries and comes up in the dead. And then that influence is so hard that you date your birthday from his birthday. That influence is so hard that an atheist has to celebrate his birthday every time he makes out a paper. Your morning newspaper will have on a 2014, dated from when? His birth. Amen. <laughs> and the guy puts out a newspaper as an atheist. Well, you're a little bit influenced, aren't you there? Amen. I mean, you can't get a hunting license, bud, without marking his birthday. You can't get a fishing license. You can't get married. You can't even publish a book. The whole world celebrates his birthday, I'd say a minimum of 15 million times a day, yeah. and now for something like 50 years. Boy, you talk about influence. That's, buddy, that's influence. Once you run into Christ, you'll never be exactly the same. Maybe you'll have your troubles and this and that, maybe it'll come, come bad to get fallen out, but you're not, not the same. You, you can't, you, you, you're born again, you're different. A little body influence. Here I am, a missionary up in Alaska, talked to me one time, been up there for 15 years. 
And he told me about the meanest man up there that ever got saved was a fellow he knew, and he told me about him. And that guy was a cutter. He was a pistol ball. I mean, he was a rascal. That guy, Wednesday night, would go into the, into the hothouse around there in the bar rooms and places and the dancing halls and get him drinking, him drinking. He'd climb on a table and hold a prayer meeting, making fun of a prayer meeting. He got up and open a bottle. Okay, let's have a little word of testimony from some of you folks on God's side. I thank God for this whore he's shacking up with. I got, I got, I got, thank God I got a pimp. I'm doing a woman. Just like, they get, making fun of Christianity. But all the time, you never such a rascal all your life. And you know what happened? He got saved. God could have killed him, but he didn't. He got him saved. And the day after he got saved, this fellow found him going back in those ballrooms, passing out tracks. <laughs> My God, what happened to that guy? Influence, boy. Hit on collision. Down in Pensacola, where I used to have a church there, Brent Baptist Church was called. We had one time a Catholic lady moved in down the street, French Catholic, and she could hear her cuss a mile off when she got cussing her husband out. She had a real temper and she had a drinker and a smoker and never would come to church. My people prayed for her, and especially the women prayed for her. They prayed for her, and she got worse and worse and worse, and, and finally she got real sick and went to the hospital. It turned out she had cancer, and she died of cancer, and she'd been in the hospital about two weeks, and the fellow in the hospital phoned me up, the chaplain, and said, they got a lady down here named so-and-so, and she said that she's up by your church someplace, and uh, the women have been coming to see her, and they say she's gotten saved. And I said, well, all right, I'll try to get down there. And they said, well, she's dying. I didn't get down there in time, but I got down there in time. You know what they told me? They told me that woman was there, and in came the priest for the last rites. You know, the candle and the bell and go through all the junk he's going to go through, you know. And he said that woman was lying there, just weak and unable to sit up running, eyes closed. And they heard her making a noise, and the priest stopped just fooling around to hear what she was doing, and she was singing. And she was singing, Jesus loved me, this I know. Because the Bible, <laughs> she'd been to a, a herd of, a, 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 a summer, summer a school, you know, of teaching Bible, and she'd gotten saved. Yeah. And she was lying there going, Jesus loved me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Little, my God, man, the cussing, raving, husband fighting, and just, Jesus loved me, this I know. What happened to that woman? Head on collision, boy. No, I don't care who you are, where you're from, what your background is. When you bump him head on, boy, something's going to change. The last the time people saw me in Pensacola, I was playing drums in a dance band night and disc jockey in the daytime and bluegrass and jazz and ragtime with it and all that stuff. They saw me going out places once when a fire, a, a riot broke out and I bumped me off the top of a Coke bottle in case things got rough. And, that, and one time they saw me doing that, and the next time they saw me, I was driving a car down the street with a bunny rabbit painted on the back of the car. And it said, come with the bunny rabbit. <laughs> and I'm picking up children for daily vacation Bible school. <laughs> I'm going up there honking the horn, the kiddies running, get in the car with the bunny. <laughs> Ruckman in there, <laughs> Ruckman in there. Been a DI and hand to hand in the army there for four years teaching kids how to kill each other. I'm with anything, you know. I mean, shoelace. You can kill a guy with a pencil, no problem at all. Uh, oh, I was teaching that for four years, and here he is. What is he doing? Get in the car with a, <laughs> with a bunny rabbit. <laughs> you know what happened? Head on collision, boy. Amen. Don't you tell me it don't influence you. Amen. You see this stuff I'm doing right now? I'm getting poorer and poorer and poorer at it right now. I can't see half the colors I have up here. And my boy helps select, select the colors before I come up to put it on because I can't see them. But you take there was a time when I used to paint. I painted 32 baptisteries, some of them 30 feet high. And I've made more than 3,000 illustrations and paint more than 100 portraits and things. And when I was an unsaved fellow, that stuff was pornographic and bad stuff. I mean, real bad. I painted them. Well, I did a picture one time of the Last Supper with all the disciples drunk. And Peter under the table with his feet sticking out and John puking and the Lord sitting there with crossed eyes. And I showed it to the guys in the service where I was in the army. 
And I'd get a laugh. I'd say, look at that. I like cats, you know. And they'd be scared to death. They'd say, Ruckman, there's some things that just aren't funny. Well, they're no more safe than I was, see. But they were religious. I wasn't even religious. And I said, look at that. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like that. That's how it was with me then. And then, boy, I got saved. And I hadn't been saved a month. And the pastor asked me to paint a baptistry for him. About uh, twice that size. And I got out there. I didn't, I hadn't used acrylic shit. I'd use oils. And I had out there and I knelt down there with my rags and oils and my brushes and started to pray and ask God to bless me and held out my brushes. And the Lord said, hey, you remember that picture you did over in the Philippines? I said, yeah, I remember that. And the Lord said, do you see any reason right now why I shouldn't take your hands off at the wrist? And I said, no, I don't see a reason why you shouldn't. It's real, boy. I thought, I felt like a sickle was going to come through the air and just clip him off. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And he said, okay, go ahead and paint. <laughs> and then after that followed uh, 64 years of painting and drawing for Christ. Amen. Now, what happened? Influence, boy, like that. And once you run to Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same again. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Some of you musicians will play us a little music here. Get our mind just on the Lord for a while. No more looking at me or your neighbor or the picture. Let's close your eyes a while where it's just you and him. Now let me ask you something. Can you, some of you can, some of you can't. Well, let me ask you something. Honestly, with your head bowed, eyes shut there, you know yourself. Let me ask you something. Can you put your finger, I mean, absolutely where it is, can you put your finger on a time when you came to God's Son as a sinner and you knew you were going to hell and you knew you were lost and you came to Him for salvation and asked Him to save your soul? Now that's what I want. A record. Has, that, has that happened to you? I'll say it again. Did you come to him, not by sight, by faith? Did you believe on him by, by faith, not by sight? You didn't see him. All right, you take, you can, I'd like to show him to you, but I can't show him to you. Did you come to him by faith, knowing you were a lost sinner? Not just a sinner, a lost sinner. Not just a sinner getting the wrath of God on you here, but getting in, in hell. Did you come and ask him to save your soul from hell? If that's never happened, will you make it tonight while you're praying back there? I tell the prisoners, if you want to receive Christ, I'll show you how to do it. And I kneel and ask them to follow me in prayer. And if they do it, they have to pray this. They pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I don't want to go to hell when I die. That's honesty. And I have them pray, Lord, I'm coming to you for salvation. Please save me and let me know it. I want assurance of salvation. I have them pray that. And I have them pray, Lord, I don't understand everything about this, but I believe you died for my sins, and from now on, I'm not going to trust anybody but you to get me home to heaven. Amen. And that'll do it. Quote, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you. Have you done it? Called upon him as a sinner who couldn't save yourself. Him, him, him. You're not praying to me. You're not praying to a bishop. You're not praying to your mother. Him. You're praying to him. Tell him. Say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell when I die. You don't, do you? Well, tell him. And say, I'm coming to you for salvation. Please save my soul and give me assurance. And he'll do it or else he's lying. And he never lied yet. Do it. Father, bless the invitation to speak to the heart of somebody, some man, some boy, some girl, some grown man or a little boy, anywhere in between. And if they haven't done this, and you know if they've done it or not, I pray they'll do it tonight and to give them the courage they need to confess you before men because you said if they'd confess you before men, you'd confess them before your Father, which is in heaven. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's stand.